uh, our upcoming panel session scheduled to start here in just a couple of minutes uh, is on engaging patients, consumers, and care partners in interoperability. And now if you could please take a few seconds to read the bios of our moderator and panelists. All right, I see that actually, I believe everybody is accounted for. Um, Jill, we've just got to have Jill. We've got Grace, we've got Crystal, we've got our other Grace. And I think we just need Jill to uh, join the join the panel with her webcam. And uh, there she is in her audio. Grace, I'm going to turn it over to you, uh, the lovely Grace Vinton, and I will go on mute and uh, look forward to the conversation. Hello, 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 everybody. Thank you for joining us. It's the afternoon here at the Interoperability Summit. We're very thrilled to be here. I'm so excited to introduce to you some really fabulous um, women leaders in the industry that are working in the day to day to improve interoperability and uh, and and different things associated with interoperability. Um, my name is Grace Vinton. I'm a healthcare PR pro, a digital health expert. I'm a podcast host of High Tea with Grace on the Hit Like a Girl podcast network, and I'm a patient advocate for young mothers navigating healthcare after birth. Um, I had my very own patient experience in 2017 where I almost died from a very easily discoverable and treatable issue that had gone unnoticed and misdiagnosed. And in that experience, I realized patients, caregivers, care partners, healthcare consumers have real lived experience, and they should be included in these conversations on healthcare innovation that, that impact them either directly or indirectly. And I know the panelists today could not agree more with me on that topic. So first, I'd like to introduce Grace Cordovano. She's a PhD. She is a board certified patient advocate. She's an oncology patient advocate. She's also a health tech founder helping unblock healthcare data. Um, she's a policy leader with the Sequoia Project, Cancer X, and more. She's also a HIMSS Changemaker finalist and a globe trotter, world recognized for her work in the patient advocacy community. So thanks for joining us, Grace. Thanks for having me. I'm super excited to be here with everyone. And next we have Crystal Schramm, who is a senior technical manager with MyHIN. She's a privacy champion, works with hospitals to send data, normalize data, and help them gain insights to improve pop, pop health from their data. She's also on the patient advisory board in Michigan, has experience working with FQHC engagement and education, and she's really well known for her work with native and indigenous populations. Thanks for joining us, Crystal. Yeah, absolutely. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. And next we have uh, Jill DeGraff, JD. She is a privacy and health tech lawyer. She's a classic family caregiver to an aging parent um, and adult children, but she plays a central role in advancing Be Well's uh, regulatory business and product strategy. And it's really based on giving consumers what they most want and need from their health care partners. Thanks for joining us, Jill. Thank you for having me. Look forward to the discussion. So I have to say, a couple years ago, I was asked to join the Care Quality Advisory Council um, and help with their interoperability framework. And I thought to myself, what the heck can I bring to the table? In the first few years, I was like, this is just, this tongue is insane. This is crazy. But at the same time, I felt so honored to be that my pain could have purpose and that I could maybe bring some patient insight to the table. And so I'm wondering, you know, there that was pretty ahead of its time. And there's a few other organizations that are doing that. But what's holding the industry back from really engaging patients consumers and care partners that want to be involved in innovation projects? Um, and how would you rate its engagement with the healthcare consumer community today um, in oncology, you know, with the indigenous tribes, et cetera? I'd love to start with Grace on this one. Sure. Thanks for the question. And I think that the biggest thing that's holding us back is assumptions. We operate on assumptions that we know all these things. We're all patients. Um, we're all going to be patients, but there's a very big difference in being a patient one day and 
being the patient that is awaiting having their stomach removed and they just want to get to Christmas dinner to have that last holiday meal with their family. It's a very different experience going to urgent care for strep throat versus trying to bounce around from 10, 20, 30 doctors trying to get a diagnosis. So those assumptions on what people need, how they receive care, what their uh, care circle looks like holds us back. Then there's the stigma of being a patient because health in healthcare, we're the only industry where when you become a patient, you also become apparently stupid, non-compliant, lazy, uh, illiterate, and all of these different things where no other industry operates in this way. We strip people of their dignity, of their autonomy, their independence, and their, their curiosity for learning and, and hide behind, well, you know what, they just really don't know. Don't Google, right? We've all seen, don't confuse your, your Google with my with my medical degree. And I think the last thing is there's really no budget. Uh, you need a budget for sustainable, not tokenistic engagement. So I encourage everyone, put a budget in for your upcoming year, figure out creative ways where you, maybe you can shift some priorities because meaningful engagement means you compensate for time, expertise, and contributions. Absolutely, Grace. You're so, so right on all of those points. Crystal, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'd love to pivot off several of the topics. So um, I love the piece about the funding and, and the tokenism. And I, I really think as a Native American and a tribal patient who attends tribal healthcare, I have experienced those firsthand. And and now being on the health IT side of the house with the interoperability, um, it, it's really become quite evident to me that a Native population is almost completely left out of the inter like interoperability conversations. Um, and it really was this big aha awareness moment for me um, in my organization because they didn't know they didn't know what they didn't know. And Native patients don't know because they're not even aware that they're missing out on all these things that could be contributing to better healthcare outcomes for them and their family members. So it's this really strange kind of walking that path of like, what do you know that you don't know? And then trying to tie those pieces together. So, um, and I think that being in this space has really, I'm really trying to provide awareness and educate those that that population needs to be included, like you said, when they're getting that patient engagement piece. Yeah, it seems that they're missing in their entire population by not including the voice there. And so I'm so thrilled that you're doing work to make sure they change that. Jill, I'd love for you to add anything else to this conversation, too, that you might feel strongly about. Sure. Um, I mean, first off, one of the things that's relevant about our co company, Be Well Connected Health, is that our patient number one, our patient zero, is Bailey Valdez, our, our founder and CEO's daughter. And, um, and I won't go into the long detail, but the bottom line is she has many and significant um, um, autoimmune issues that she has to urgently manage and that Kristen manages with her as her care partner. And she has 27 unique patient portals. And there are that, that fragmentation is the issue that so many patients confront. And, and I get to say from my perspective, having been a, being a breast cancer survivor, I think the best healthcare is the healthcare you never need. I mean, I'm glad to be eight years surviving, but when I have to go back into the healthcare uh, system, it's just astonishing to me how little has changed. And you know, we all know there are many burdens that we all care about solving, but from a patient perspective, um, they all come across as microaggressions and there's so much that we can do. And so much of doing that is, and I guess what I would say is, that um, we, the, those of us who are here, we are solvers. We like to create solutions. We are building those coalitions every day. And the innovators who are trying to bring the patient's um, needs at the center are really important. Sometimes if we are not um, getting the, 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 the focal groups, the focus groups together, we can also work with the innovators that are looking to deliver those solutions. So true. You know, patients, caregivers, healthcare consumers, care partners, we should not have to bear the brunt of healthcare record fragmentation. 100%. That should not be on us. And I'm so grateful for the work you're doing too, Jill, in this space. Uh, so let's move on to kind of the next topic. Why does the healthcare consumer voice matter? What can consumers bring to the table that is otherwise lacking? And why does diversity of background and thought matter? Uh, let's start with you, Crystal. Yeah. 
So um, I think as, as a Native American person, um, one of the biggest things right now is understanding our own identity and how that's fitting in the data and wanting to get a bigger handle on, is this our data? Where does our data end? Where does it begin? And there, you know, there are 574 federally recognized tribes across the United States. That's 574 unique populations that want to be able to look at their population of data for the, those patients. And I think that it really goes back to um, the identity and, and understanding who our patients are, looking at the demographics and, you know, listening to some of those early uh, sessions, thinking about the, you know, how do you know that person is that person and understanding what are we really putting into that those race and ethnicity categories that needs to quantify who these patients really are. So I, I think it, it's all of it. It's the data piece. It's the um, awareness piece. And it's the bringing the patient to the table and saying, how, how do you feel that you're being misrepresented? You know, asking those questions to the patient, letting them have a voice um, and making sure that there is representation across the board. Mm, so true. Grace, I'd love to hear your perspective. Why does the healthcare consumer voice matter? What can consumers bring to the table that's lacking otherwise? You know, I had a pretty profound experience with the Sequoia Project's Consumer Voices Work Group Project. It was a group of amazing regular patients, caregivers that could be uh, someone you run into at the grocery store or at work. And they completely flatten this stigma that patients don't care, caregivers don't care, they don't know how to use the portal. These are regular people who were so curious, so willing to learn, so eager to share their experiences. And I, we all had so many jaw drop moments listening. So you all know I'm obsessed with patient stories. And I say that all the time, but it, for months, we just sat and listened and learned. And I think the voice thing isn't taken seriously enough. And I love, Crystal, what you're saying about the awareness, because many of the things that we raised as co-chairs through these topics was an awareness about what your rights are and different policies. And while they may not have been knowledgeable about a particular topic, once the awareness was there, you could see sparks flying, curiosity, questions, suggestions, connecting the dots into personal experience, personal tragedies, personal successes. So it's really the awareness piece. It is a strategic business insight for us to be able to gather those sparks and jewels of wisdom, not just to include the voice. How do you get that engagement and those sparks to start coming to your organization to really shape the fog and around your strategy and really glean from the audience or your, your patients and consumers? What do they need? What do they want? What works well? What doesn't? Where can we improve? And how do you partner to meet all those needs? Not only your patients' needs, but usually the patient administrative burdens and challenges are the other side of the coin to what our providers are facing. So if you can solve for both the provider and the patient, that's a silver bullet. Absolutely. And it seems you really created this environment where patients and caregivers felt that they could be open and honest about their experiences and ask the right questions. Because it does seem that sometimes the questions that are asked are so convoluted, patients don't even know how their story would fit in or how to answer it. So I think that's so key, having the right um, the right place, right time, and right questions. Jill, I'd love for you to add your perspective here too. Yeah, I have two. Um, one is, again, going back to the fact that this community, we are solutions oriented, but we also operate in this framework of building consensus to advance standards. And we also, someone in an earlier panel had asked the question about which are the top most priorities. Those conversations, like the ones that Grace is describing, those are the conversations where priorities are being surfaced and then voted on. They're being ranked. And so you have to have patients participate in order to elevate the priorities for those that matter most to patients. That's like number one. So that's why it matters in our communities for interoperability. Um, but I loved also that idea around um, capturing the feedback in real time and even finding those double win or like triple line objectives or bottom line objectives. And I, and, and uh, it is really the reason for being for be well, because ultimately we are looking to create a consumer front end experience that can, um, you know, drive um, intelligence and insight and not alienate the consumer. And when they most need care, navigate them most easily to the care they need, building loyalty with those who are willing to deliver that kind of capability. And if you're delivering that kind of a capability on fire data, 
which is real time and streamed, that same data can be used to drive population health and other objectives. And so we should be looking for those win-wins when we are looking for the um, priorities we wanna set in our, um, in our interoperability objectives. Wow, that was so impactful. I've never thought about the fact that, you know, you're right, in interoperability, open standards matter, and it should be the same in term, when we're including the patient voice. Those standards should matter, and, and, and having it be open is, is critical. Um, so who is doing patient-consumer care partner, partner engagement well? Uh, what strategies are they using that the industry could learn from? You know, we know it's important, it's critical. You know, the industry should be 10, 10 steps ahead of where it is now. But, you know, who is doing it right in the space and, and what can the rest of the industry that is listening in today learn from them? Um, we'll start with Crystal on this one. <laughs> Like, why are you guys start with me? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, no. Uh, so one of the things uh, that we are doing in Michigan is there's a health equity grant. And again, this goes back to funding, right? But I am going to give this example because I think it's important. Um, and it's to help improve maternal health care. And so we have a patient and community action board where we have patients and it's a very diverse group. They did a very excellent job recruiting us. I'm on there from a Native American perspective. Um, and we just went to, they have two uh, semi-annual OB initiatives uh, meetings with all these people, like nurses, doctors, all the quality people, they're looking at the measures. And we got up in front of all these people, and we all told our story um, about significant um, maternal health care events. And, and I think having those moments, um, not just when you have like a patient and family advisory council who's behind the scenes and people don't really know what's happening, but kind of getting patients more engaged and involved, I, I think that's going to be a win because um, patients are feeling they're feeling like they matter that our group that that board already feels like we have this bond um and so i think patients as patients we can learn from one another too in those moments we can like learn like grace was saying from tragedy and from successes i think that's really important to point out absolutely jill do you have any recommendations of folks that are doing things right and what are they doing right well, I'm going to key off of the maternal health for a moment because one of our customers, which is a health system in Florida, is prioritizing maternal health for its consumer front end experience. The, the pathways that we're building that will be linking the consumer front end experience with the clinical pathways is centering first on maternal health. And so the idea is we build the experience informed by those who most know that patient population and those who provide care to them. But then also the proof is in the pudding because we use standard product management and delivery goals, user testing, user feedback, the data doesn't lie. And that's how you iterate and get better. So, I mean, there are those sort of, we're at a stage, I, I think what this is really talking about is, uh, first of all, I just love all the work that has been described in the earlier panels, but also what happens is what development occurs and innovation occurs at the edge where the consumer interfaces the health system. And that can be in person, it can be digitally and virtual. And so what we wanna do is make, sh and, and the beauty, beauty of digital and virtual is you've got data <laughs> and you can start making inferences at a different kind of scale. But let me also say, you must always do that under a foundation of trust. So here we are with direct trust, part of your DNA, and it's part of the DNA of all those solutions as well. Mm, very true. Grace, I'd love to hear your perspective on this one. You know, I had to think when you asked this question, but I definitely have three that I want to share. So I'm going to plug Sequoia Project again. Why? Their consumer voices work group was fantastic. Why was it fantastic? Diverse representation of voices. It wasn't just the patient. It was patients, care partners, advocates. There was continuity. It wasn't one meeting we met for months. There was an end deliverable, a publication, a presentation. There was inclusion into the regular workflow of meetings. So this wasn't your token patient. This is now a partner and a professional, and they went so far as to compensate to include patients at their annual meeting, put patients on stage, and the patients 
They, that, that was one, I'm going to be biased, but it was by far one of the most electrifying uh, conversations that we had that spawned so many different side conversations after. Um, and I'm going to say not only was the publication something that was something to be celebrated based on all the work group's findings, it's now driving the next phase of work. So that continuity is very important. I'm going to give a shout out to Invite because Invite published this beautiful data use transparency report, which I think should be industry gold standard of how data is being used. It was um, written in a way that shows how they're, how they're using the data, building trust, what the data use is fostering, what type of advances scientifically it's leading to. It really allows an individual who may be new to the space to see, wow, this is, this is what I can contribute to. This is the power of my data. This is how it can advance research. And there's an opportunity to say, no, I don't want to do this, or I give my consent to partner with you and use my data in a way that I trust. And to have this type of a report at the end is just the icing on the cake. And I would say Savvy Cooperative does a fantastic job and their whole push is ask patients. They have made it a no excuse opportunity for anyone who's looking for patient insights to have a seamless experience to engage with patients and to be able to accomplish getting patient insights into whatever type of innovation ideation life cycle you may be working on. I have to say Savvy Coop has done a fantastic job including patients paying them for their time flying them to conferences, flying them where they need to go. Pharma can work with them. Healthcare technology organizations can work with them. Health systems and hospitals can work with them. And they can even get you a specific subset of patient or caregiver that uh, specific to whatever condition you're trying to research or find out more about. So they've done a great job. I just saw them at the Health Foundation's um, a Genius Bar that they set up at the Health Conference, and they had patients of all different diverse backgrounds and experiences answering questions of, of uh, innovation founders and, and even investors and other folks that had questions to inform the work that they're doing. So really interesting. I want to also mention that the National Health Council has a patient engagement fair market value. So if you do plan to include patients, you know, consumer, um, caregiver insight, care partner insight into what you're doing, make sure you take a look at the National Health Council fair market value rate. So that's how you know how much you're supposed to pay these patients, right? And these, and these healthcare consumers willing to share their pain for you to improve the innovation um, that you're doing, whether it be an interoperability or any other data and analytics um, a topic that you might be working on. So I'm wondering, uh, what are your top three pieces of advice now for organizations hoping to better engage patients consumers and care partners in their innovation projects, um, in development, planning, and execution. Um, we'll start with maybe Jill on this one. Uh, would you want to start here? Your top three pieces of advice for organizations. I guess I'm going to go with um, deliver a, I love the idea of integrating patients within the entire product development and delivery life cycle, which we have talked about already. But within that context, the consideration is always what's the value for the patient like what and and of course those those multiple bottom line objectives that you're trying to get off of a common platform or, or use case so I, I guess um in that context i really think it might be worthwhile thinking about all the data that you need recognizing the gaps participate in the um ongoing advancement of enabling access to that data through patient access APIs. Patient consented data is a superpower for organizations. You have the patient access payment rule, which makes that data readily available. It comes in, to fi in through fire. And our problem is that it's, it's scappy still. We still don't have patient access APIs for pharmacies or for labs or for commercial people who get their insurance through commercial plans. Um, and, and we can actually improve that front end experience and deliver when you're like, so that you can improve that why buy when you are talking with your with your um, consumers and patients and care partners. Um, other things that have to be front and center, though, um, and I almost just through this conversation thinking we ought to almost, you know, endorse some kind of a framework of principles for engaging consumers, where I'm thinking about what's the data and what's the use case for you and does it work? Make the ability to pull that data in 
easier, go back to the conversation that was that Kyle was leading around digital identity and federation. That's a superpower if we can get it activated. And then also, um, and those other capabilities um, that, that is being advanced um, and the priorities around pharmacy and labs, scheduling and other um, capabilities to continue to advance interoperability at the edge. Um, all the work you're doing for treatment, please keep doing it. But there's also the ability to repurpose and use for these end use cases with consumers. Great advice. Crystal, I'd love to give this to, uh, over to you now. You know, your top advice for organizations to better engage patients and can healthcare consumers. Yeah, I, I think um, awareness is is probably my number one thing. I think providing, never like Grace was saying, don't make assumptions, um, providing awareness, educating about interoperability. Don't make them feel like they're a stranger to all these topics, because if they don't know that, you know, I always tell people they don't know we exist unless it's broken. People that only know we exist are the people that work in it. So these patients don't even understand the what can happen by not participating and by not sharing their data, what could actually happen to them as a negative health outcome consequence. And I think that is a key message that we need to keep um, pushing with our patient populations and with our um, healthcare leaders. And I love the idea of standardizing some kind of framework or, or standard that we can share um, amongst stakeholder organizations because we're all on interoperability and we're talking about standardization. Let's use the stuff we're already doing and put it to play in here too and make it fit with the patient engagement world. Um, I think that if we can continue to mold and iterate, like Jill said, I think it's a constant evolving thing and it's a living, breathing thing. And we have to be aware that it's constantly changing. Grace, I'd love your three uh, top pieces of advice as well. Get someone that's a, a patient representative, a care partner representative on your leadership committee, on your leadership team. So it's it's baked into your regular day-to-day -day strategy. I'm going to challenge and encourage everyone to think past just listening to patient unmet needs. Spark inquisitiveness and curiosity. That's your challenge because that's where the wisdom is going to come from. And I'm going to say, make sure you're tackling patient administrative burden. How are your efforts decreasing the manual labor and work that people need to do to get the care that they need? And that will help you, especially this side of the pandemic where we have staff shortages, where we have a difficulty connecting with an actual human being. How can we incorporate more actionable insights, more digital health tools to streamline very bumpy processes in a nice way? And I'm going to give you a bonus one, number four, incorporate the insights of surviving care partners. This is applicable to life altering, life limiting situations and of life care. There's a person who has been caring for their loved one who has died, who has gone through hell and back and can tell you all of these different issues that they've run into. We're not talking to these people. And I'm encouraging everyone, include the surviving care partners. Not only is it healing for them to be able to give back and share this wisdom and engage as part of their grieving process, but the insights are powerful and you can get some low hanging fruit on where you may want to tweak your strategies, no matter where you're working in interoperability to really drive incremental, meaningful change. Thank you so much, Grace. Fantastic advice. Now I have to ask this question. Why interoperability, right? Like we need to include the patient voice. The patient voice is powerful, but why interoperability in particular? Um, I'd love to kind of start this off with maybe Grace. Why interoperability here? You know, they can talk about any innovation. Why is interoperability important to consider? From my perspective, when you're in healthcare, when it's something that's multiple comorbidities, life altering, life limiting, a, a terminal situation and end of life care, the reality is it's so complicated day to day, no one is coming to save you. If you have access to the information that you need, you can make informed, educated decisions about your care. Because of having access to health information, we need to move past celebrating just access. Access is great. It's actionable access, being able to act. I want people to have a competitive advantage against their diagnosis. The only way to do that is to have access to your own central source of truth, and that is interoperability. 
where you are, whether you're in a tribal community, whether in your New York City or whether you're traveling and, and backpacking through Asia and Europe, that information needs to be there with you because you never know when that rug is going to be pulled out from under you or from a loved one. And the only way to make quick decisions is to have instant actionable access. Jill, I'd love to have your experience here too. What are your thoughts? Well, first off, I just want to rinse and repeat what Grace said. That was beautiful. Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Powerful. <laughs> yes. Um, mm -hmm. Well, and I think also we're looking at all of the disruption in our um, in our industry, and we have to be prepared for it. We, there, there's probably a self-interested component here that we do have to figure out solutions that will re reduce the administrative burden and we think about things like generative AI, we think about just, you know, creating the, the plug and play pieces, bolting on the pieces of integration. We have so much of um, things that are natural and obvious outside of the healthcare sector that can be done to streamline workflows and integrate those workflows more seamlessly so that we can actually start reducing the burdens and the burnout. Um, and so that's just so important to do that because the patient can actually do a lot of that work. Just as Grace was saying, we have clients that were able, you know, because when the, when the, when um, the COVID vaccine was started, our, we had a client that called us and they said, oh yeah, we're not going to actually go live with what we were working on. Instead, we are going to be administering all these vaccines. We need a new scheduling capability and we don't want to limit it to our, our registered patients. We want to make it available to our community. We have that obligation. And so we had to build out a whole new capability. We were, we were there for it because you know what, what that does is you get to take nurses off the call center line to triage, you get to book a next appointment. That's what people want. They do, they want to use, have an open table kind of experience when they're scheduling routine care, especially. So let's work on those use cases and enable the technologies, enable the innovators to do that work, which means opening up um, the legacy um, uh, information systems. Mm, so true. So true. Crystal, I'd love to put this over to you and also ask, you know, how can interoperability better improve population health generally just by help, you know, including that patient and caregiver voice in the interoperability projects? Yeah, I, I love that idea. Um, I, Cause I think what Grace said is, you know, I think about patients move in and out of all kinds of areas all the time. Um, federally qualified health centers, tribal health clinics, the VA hospitals, and the data needs to follow the patient, number one. And right now that does not happen to everybody. So we need to be willing to admit that. Um, and then number two, whatever data we are getting, we need to be able to take that that data and know who our patient is. Who who are these people? What what's the, what's their story? Who like Grace said? Who is the caregiver? What has happened in their life? And really um, use that knowledge to to strategically think about how we're going to really make change. I mean, you think about the surveys in hospitals, how many, how many years have we been using, you know, whatever the CAP survey or whatever it is, you know, how are we going to refresh the same things we've done for years? Um, and, and even I think about what Jill was saying with, you know, product development, do we bring patients in when we talk about the next features we're going to put um, into a patient portal? Or do you go into Athena and as a person working in the EMR, as the clinical user, you're the one saying, I need this, this, and this for my workflow. But is anyone asking the patient, what are the features that they care about? Um, I, I think we really need to think outside the box and be willing to admit that we have done successful things, but there are lots of areas we can learn and um, take advantage of those. You know, if I, if, can I pop in? Yes, feel like, free. Mm -hmm. I mean, so we center around tenets of loyalty, which I think would be worthwhile, you know, a broader audience thinking about as well for consumers. One is, you know, and we sort of think of t access to care or access to data as table stakes. We need to move beyond that, right? But um, because what, what our, our founder and CEO, Kristen Valdez, will often say is the war to be won is access to care. You know, people are alienated from the health system because, uh, because of, you know, necessary fragility or the fragility that has been revealed in the system. And we need to address it. There's so many ways to address it. But at the end of the day, 
what people most care and want when they need care is access to care. <laughs> so there's those things, but then also there needs to be the idea of not adopting a paternalistic stance towards patients, but instead to enable them and empower them to um, identify who their care partners are and what actions those care partners can take on their behalf. As I, as, as you said in the introduction for me, I have two adult young you know, children in their 20s, older children in their 20s, and I'm introducing them to the health system. It's really eye-opening when I see it through their eyes, but I'm also navigating it for my mom. And it is, um, and she has many more care needs. And so you need to be able to participate, um, you know, de deliver solutions that respect those choices and that also, um, you know, offers robust enough controls to preserve trust and integrity in those patient choices. Um, so I'll just go back again, trust is key. And I will say, you know, one of the things, speaking as a privacy lawyer, is that um, many of the use cases that exist for patients can sit simultaneously in a HIPAA environment, but outside of HIPAA too. And we shouldn't be afraid of it if we are willing to adopt, if you will, a code of conduct and trust framework, which is one of the sentinel events or sentinel activities that the Karen Alliance put forward as a, um, you know, coalition of interested stakeholders for consumer mediated health information access and exchange. And, and I would be, um, I, I would just like to say, I, I went to the Sequoia and Care Quality Annual Meeting, love to hear all the things that they're doing and believe that another way we can take root is to take root in a trust framework uh, or a, a code of conduct as you start looking through the downstream effects for um, or downstream um, activities of the participants. We need to have accountability throughout all inter interoperability, and we can do that by you know, and because it's a voluntary um, uh, endeavor, we can hold ourselves to a higher standard under a trust framework. And maybe the Karen Alliance Code of Conduct is a way to get started on that. Absolutely, Grace. Do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, you know, I want to talk about features. We talk about features as if, you know, a patient states they have an unmet need, we need a new feature. We need more than features. We need to be able to perform a full task, guys, like file a social security disability application, appeal an insurance denial, organize a tumor board, schedule a second opinion, gathering records from 25 different providers. So I think we need to start bundling in a way that people can start helping themselves. And, and we always compare to other industries. So I have to think to the travel industry, how you used to go to a travel agent, you had to sit there, they printed out your card and your plane ticket. Well, now people have absorbed that administrative burden by choice because it allows them to personalize their experience. And that experience, like I would be lost without my United app, my, my Acela and, and my Uber. But we're, you know, we're, 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 we're making progress towards that in healthcare, but we're so focused on individual features like, wow, look at this shiny new thing that I built. Guess what? It doesn't have to be that shiny. Just get me all the right data elements so that I can apply for all of these things and just get it done with a few keystrokes. Um, I think there's a big disconnect there because we're not recognizing that patient administrative burden and the toll it takes and that patient burnout is a silent public health crisis. People mm. are unable to carry the burden of what is required of them to get the care that they need. And I feel like if there was some emphasis on that study and you were very well versed in provider and physician burnout and moral injury, we have a long way to go in understanding what the people, what the consumers, what the patients and their families are going through to try to navigate U.S. healthcare and interoperability and fire and all of these wonderful things that are in the pipes. Um, Tefka, all are part of a, a really nice solution to hopefully improve and level set. Mm, well, so true. Can, do you mm -hmm. mind if I pop in? Yeah, there? absolutely. Um, pop in. The, um, you know, when we talk about consumer voices, uh, consumer interest, it, think about the fact that 86% of healthcare decisions is managed by the healthcare CEO of every family, right? And that's usually a woman, 86% of the time, that's a woman, right? So 
what are we what are we navigating? We're not na just navigating decisions off of clinical data. We're navigating decisions off of financial data. And we may have a transparency and coverage rule, but that data is not actionable. Going to Grace's point earlier, we do need to, you know, when we talk about where part, why you need to have a patient voice, it's so that you can bubble up and prioritize patient access APIs for making that data interoperable, for making real time pharmacy benefit check and similar use cases like that actionable. Um, Anna McAllister during the um, one of the high tech meetings where they were reviewing pharmacy interoperability recommendations last month made an awesome observation that if if the physician is able in their in their in their I okay, can't remember how you pronounce it but the um you know the 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 computerized prescribing order entry system if they could also find out not only what the price is based on your coverage is but also can say based on the pharmacy that you prefer whether the phar pharmacy even can get supply for that and if so when then you are saving a patient time and aggravation of long lines redirecting them to another pharmacy. And if you can have that also support, once you support that, there's no reason not to support it with the patient because guess what? More often than not, you can have very motivated patients or care partners who are more up on the ball than, provi than the providers and can educate the providers in all of those sort of multiple ways if you empower them with that data and that um, data access. Mm, so true. So true. I don't think the industry realizes that the patient is going to be the CEO of their own care, whether they like it or not, because they have to, because their healthcare is so fragmented, because sometimes they have to sell triage and go to urgent care. And sometimes that urgent care has a different EHR than their normal provider. And sometimes they have a different EHR than the virtual care provider that they used for a different issue. And so the, the patient is going to become the CEO of their own care, whether the industry is willing to keep up with it or not, and whether the interoperability frameworks and regulations keep up with it to a point where they're actually having the accurate information about their own health in front of them when they are making these self-triage decisions. Um, Crystal, I'd love for you to give some perspective too on what you think the future of healthcare interoperability for including the patient voice looks like. I, I think it really, um, you know, there's been so much focus, you know, with inclusion and equity. And I think a lot of, I think they're in, in social determinants of health. And I think all of those components that, that community piece, looking at the entire, um, personnel, the, the whole picture of the patient. Um, I think that's what we were leaning towards. And I think that's what's what's going to happen. We're going to start pulling in all of those other data pieces, um, you know, utilizing those other sources to really guide the the healthcare outcomes for the patient. And, and I, this, you know, panel has given me lots of ideas already, even just thinking about things that we could start doing differently or, or just thinking outside of the box. So I think keeping the conversation open with us as individuals and making patient engagement a continuous priority for um, healthcare administration and leaders, um, despite funding or anything else, keeping it in, keeping it there. <laughs> Thank you so much, Crystal. And thanks to you, Grace, Jill, and Crystal for joining us today. I loved being able to learn from you. And I think the rest of us can say, wow, <laughs> we got a lot of information in 40 minutes. And we're very grateful for the time you guys took out of your, your day to share your insights.